If you've ever played an isometric action RPG like Diablo 3, Path of Exile, Grim Dawn, or Torchlight, then you might recall how random loot drops are a huge component of the genre. This randomness takes different forms depending on the specific title, but in each of them, it is a major contributor to the exceptionally long replayability of these games. You might spend hours grinding away in search of a specific piece of equipment to no avail. Then it could drop 30 seconds into your next play session. And when gearing up accounts for such a large part of this genre's gameplay, these games can live or die by how skillfully they implement their randomness to get your access to that gear. Chances are you are someone, or know someone, who has played a game like Diablo 2 and found it quite addicting in a stay up all night to find that next piece of gear way. So it's probably no surprise to you that hack and slashes excel at tugging on our brains in a way that strongly compels us to keep playing them. As it turns out, random loot drops and many other aspects of hack and slash games are a manifestation of a very well understood psychological concept, operant conditioning. This behavior was scientifically recognized as early as the 1930s and gives us the modern term Skinner box or operant conditioning chamber. B.F. Skinner's eponymous conditioning chamber was essentially an animal cage designed to teach the subject a specific behavior. Suppose that the only way to get food inside this cage is by pushing a lever. In time, a subject will learn that pushing the lever means that food will come. What about if the lever provides food, but only after a sound cue has been played? With enough reinforcement, a subject, maybe a mouse or a rat, pushing the lever in response to a sound can acquire this learned behavior because it's been conditioned or taught to do so. By providing a stimulus and its subsequent reward, a rat can learn to link its own actions with a given result. And if you repeat this experiment a week from now using the same rat, it might run straight to the lever once it's placed in the device. We consider this a form of operant conditioning, instilling on the subject the tendency to exhibit a specific and voluntary behavior, the consequences of which will seek to reinforce that behavior in the subject. Here's a more relatable example. If you don't feel awake until you've had a cup of coffee, then you're already conditioned to have coffee every morning. The feeling of being truly awake that you get from coffee is a form of positive reinforcement that encourages you to keep drinking coffee daily. Quick sidebar here. I want to be careful not to imply that this genre is nothing more than just well-designed Skinner boxes. To me, this is a little bit like saying, a race car is just a bicycle in disguise. I mean, kind of, not, not really, it's, but sort of. I think we can do a little better than this, dismissing complex systems of game mechanics as little more than a transparent psychological experiment. Using this psychological lens can be a fantastic way of gaining insight into some of our favorite games. That being said, the link between operant conditioning and randomness in games is fairly explicit. The player has a goal that they want to achieve, and randomness prevents that goal from being instantaneous and effortless. So we're willing to try endlessly to reach that goal, which reinforces the behavior and starts the loop over. Imagine if every time you tried to make a pot of coffee, there was a 50% chance that it just suddenly disappeared into the ether whenever it was finished brewing. Now we're in the same position as that lab rat pulling the lever in the Skinner box. If you really want that coffee, you might be willing to try making another two, three, four, or 10 pots of coffee because you know that one of these times you're gonna get to drink it. And as much of an inconvenience as this would be in real life, we actually respond extremely well to such inconsistencies in video games and other leisure activities. After all, how fun would it really be if every time you played poker, you always got a royal flush? Removing that element of randomness, there's no tension, no suspense or eventual reward and the act of actually playing poker would get boring pretty quickly. But if you just put the right amount of randomness in, say drawing five random cards from a deck of 52, you've created one of the world's most popular card games. So where do we see operant conditioning in games like Diablo, Path of Exile, or Grim Dawn? The most obvious source is the random loot from monsters. Monster loot operates on a variable ratio schedule. In other words, you don't know how many monsters you need to kill until the next great item drop. It could be 10,000 monsters from now, or it could be the very next one. This is probably the largest component of addictiveness in these games, as variable ratio scheduling typically elicits a huge number of responses in a relatively short window of time. A response, in this case, is killing a single enemy, much like the response for our caged rat is to push the lever. This is just one reason why a game like Diablo is addicting. You never know when the next amazing thing is going to drop, but you're willing to spend just a few more minutes mowing down enemies in case it does drop. There are, of course, many other factors to consider. You can probably think of other game mechanics in this genre that condition the player to perform specific behaviors with the promise of reward. And how about the end game in these hack and slashes? 
Diablo 3 has rifts and greater rifts, the latter of which has no difficulty ceiling. You can choose to play through a randomly generated map or rift, which can be many times harder than the hardest difficulty setting normally available. The incentive for doing so, aside from the gold, experience, and items, is that you can upgrade a set of items called Legendary Gems. These gems can only be upgraded by completing the Greater Rift, and only between 3 and 5 times each Greater Rift. But here's the lever in our rat and lever analogy. Upgrading a gem is not guaranteed to work. The higher level the gem already is, the more likely it is that the attempt will fail, starting from 100% success and falling to just a 3 or 4% chance. And since you only get so many attempts per Greater Rift, we're still dealing with that same variable ratio scheduling. You know that each attempt has a chance to succeed, just like killing monsters for good loot. But there's no telling how long or how many tries it will take. The major difference, though, between this example and item drops for monsters is that we are explicitly told the chances of success. So if our odds are 60% we fail and 40% we succeed, we might decide to try upgrading a lower level gem that has a better chance of success. Alternatively, if we're feeling lucky but consequently fail three times in a row with a 60% success chance, we might feel like we've just expended our unluckiness and we're out of the rut, so we might even be tempted to run another Greater Rift just to have another shot at it. This is the gambler's fallacy, by the way, thinking that past events can affect future odds, when in reality the two are actually independent. But this can help explain why, even when we fail at something in a game, it can sometimes motivate us to play for longer. It's no coincidence that random item drops and winning big on a slot machine are both governed by a variable ratio schedule. Speaking of slot machines, we know that gambling is addictive all by itself. But how about spending a small fortune buying mystery items from Geed, the gambler NPC in Diablo 2? I'm Geed, and I can already tell that I'll be your best friend in this forsaken camp. I didn't know this when I played the game regularly, but the chance for a unique item from Geed is 0.05%, or just one in every 2,000 gambles. Compared to the slow burn of slaying monsters out in the field to find loot, this allows for a rapid-fire series of responses from the player as long as they have enough gold. And because gold drops so abundantly already, you'll almost never want for it. Since gold is so plentiful, the only way to gate the player's acquisition of good gear through gambling is to A. Make it relatively pricey per gamble, or B. Make the odds of a successful gamble so low that it makes sense to just spend that time farming instead. In other words, you might forego gambling altogether because the chance of getting something good is so remote that it doesn't seem worth the time or the effort. So even though Diablo 2's gambling is also a form of variable ratio scheduling, it's not nearly as compelling as just killing hundreds of monsters. Gold also has its own inherent issues that make it essentially worthless. You can't carry an unlimited amount, and with so few gold sinks built into the game, it's quite easy to push up against the gold cap. You also lose a flat percentage of your max gold every time you die, up to 20% once you've passed level 20, which sounds pretty bad, but means pretty much nothing because you weren't going to use it anyway. In the end, there isn't nearly enough economic strength in gold, which helps to explain why the de facto currency for nearly the entirety of the game's lifespan has instead been the Stone of Jordan, a unique ring. And because the only way to get the Stone of Jordan is through a random drop, this serves to help reinforce your monster slaying behavior instead of finding some fast or easy way to grind out gold. Diablo 3's take on gambling is a little more streamlined and much more economically feasible. The chance for a legendary or set item when gambling is just 1 in 10, but the currency that you use for gambling, blood shards, can only be found in rifts, and the amount that you gain from completing a rift depends on the difficulty setting. Running a rift around level 60 on hard mode nets you somewhere around 20 to 40 blood shards, while a rift at torment 13, the hardest difficulty setting, can get you hundreds. Gambling is now more strongly tied to your overall character progression, the stronger you are, the more currency you can gamble away. Where Diablo 2's gold was variable ratio scheduled just like its loot, Diablo 3's blood shards are essentially a fixed ratio currency. You only get them once you complete a rift, and as long as you're sticking to the same difficulty, you'll generally get the same amount every time. The cap for blood shards is initially 500, which is 20 gambles for the cheapest items and just 5 of the most expensive. There's a really nice self-contained gameplay loop here that serves to pace the gambling experience run a rift and get some blood shards at the end, then gamble them away and run another rift to get more. This is a much more effective way to subtly nudge at the player to gamble more frequently, but with lesser amounts of currency. And since the amount of blood shards you get is consistent, we don't have the valleys and spikes that a variable ratio schedule would give us. If you currently make 500 blood shards every 10 minutes, you know that doubling your clear speed will net about twice as many blood shards in the same amount of time. So if speed farming produces the highest rate of rewards, and the chance of a legendary through gambling is so high, it should be a piece of cake to gear up, right? 
Well, there's another, much more subtle application of variable ratio scheduling that we can observe through gambling. Item weights. Legendary items in Diablo 3 have their own hidden weighting, which divides them into rarity tiers within the same type, and in the case of certain item slots, by weapon type. Here's what I mean. If you gamble 1,000 one-handed weapons in Diablo 3, you'll get on average 100 legendaries or set pieces, but you're more likely to get a sword than you are a dagger, and you're more likely to get a dagger than you are a spear. If you gamble for rings, you're twice as likely to get a puzzle ring than you are a Stone of Jordan, and you're twice as likely to get a Stone of Jordan as you are a Ring of Larceny. There's generally a four times spread between the most frequently seen legendary items and the least frequently seen. Even though Diablo 3 drops legendary items fairly frequently, there are still over 500 of them, and many are weighted in such a way that they're extremely scarce, so there are always a few that you'll be hard pressed to find. But persevere and get a complete gear set, and we can start to wade into the endgame, which is where the real gear grind begins. Diablo 3's endgame equipment is typically a complete set of uniquely named legendaries, so if you're using a guide, there's almost no guesswork involved. Just gamble or grind away until you have this exact helmet, that exact weapon, those exact boots, and so on. But getting a perfect or nearly perfect gear set is still a daunting task. But because each item always rolls with the same list of stats, and these stat ranges are pretty narrow, you only need a few of these items before you can jump four or five difficulty levels. Now that might sound like a huge leap in power, and it is, but Diablo 3 in its current state has 17 separate difficulty levels. This is definitely a cluster in its own right, but you can easily reach endgame using only a select few of them while ignoring the rest. Once you've reached the endgame with your gear, the focus becomes continuously finding slightly better gear with slightly better stat rolls than you currently have. Pretty much every hack and slash out there gates endgame progression through diminishing returns on gear improvement. It's easy to get good gear at first. But you'll start to find that the time you invest playing in the endgame returns only marginal improvements on your gear. Diminishing returns really kick in when you're max level and you start greater rifts, which as we mentioned before, can scale their difficulty infinitely. At that point, the best way to improve your gear is by finding the ancient version of your legendary items, which are pretty much identical to regular legendaries, except that the range on their basic stats is increased by a fair amount, about 30%. So if the max strength roll on a legendary item is plus 500, then the ancient version might go up to 700 or 750. But it's not that easy. Ancient legendaries are a 1 in 10 drop. And remember how we discussed that certain legendaries are weighted to be 4 times as rare as others of the same item type? Here's where the chase really comes in. There are some items that are so rare that you can play for an entire 3 month season without ever seeing them, let alone the ancient version. And once you've gotten a set of ancient legendaries, you can continue to level up because there's no level cap, and you can also continue to rank up your legendary gems because there's no difficulty cap either. So even with your gear finalized, there's still a strong incentive to continue slaying monsters to find slightly better versions of that gear, as well as to level up your character as high as you can. If we consider each of these grinds to be analogous to a rat pushing a lever, we'll find that gradually we're able to push the lever more frequently, and our rewards, legendary items, are subsequently more frequent as well. So if you found the leveling process to be a bit dull because of its relatively slow speed and shortage of legendary gear, then it's quite possible that even with diminishing returns, you'll feel the need to pull that RNG lever even more strongly and be ever more compelled to play, simply because you can do it all faster. Here's a chart of my legendary drops in Diablo 3's current season. You can see that all through the leveling process, legendaries are few and far between. They're drip fed to you just frequently enough to cultivate that just 10 more minutes mindset while leveling. But look what happens when you reach level 70 and you start progressing through the endgame. Notice the ever-increasing frequency of drops as my clear speed increases. By providing you with ever more frequent drops, Diablo 3 attempts to offset the diminished excitement you get from item drops. By the time that getting one legendary is no longer exciting, getting two might be fresh and interesting. And by the time you can nab two or three from each rift, it might actually take four or five to really match the excitement you first felt. As for our coffee analogy, drink one cup of coffee enough days in a row and your tolerance builds up. That one cup still has you feeling sleepy, so you reset your baseline at one cup and add a second cup every day. The bottom line is that when a repeated behavior becomes less psychologically rewarding, an easy way to recapture that magic, at least in hack and slashes, is just to give more of that reward. But even this has diminishing returns. Each of these drops is just a little less exciting than the one before it, and now I'm in a mindset where I'm expecting larger rewards all the time. Maybe getting 5 legendary items in a single rift is still only 90% as rewarding as the 1 per hour that I got while I was leveling. We're going to come back to this chart because there's a very interesting pattern here that we haven't touched on. For the sake of comparison, let's get a quick second opinion here from another popular hack and slash game, Path of Exile. 
These two games share very little in common, and consequently, the endgame in Path of Exile works quite differently. There are no legendary items in the game, only uniques, which aren't inherently more powerful than their standard counterparts. In fact, they usually involve a serious downside in exchange for an ability that is literally unique to that item. So there is no cookie-cutter equipment set that everyone can slap on. Instead, the heavy reliance on well-rolled rares does a fantastic job at hooking you for the long term, because there's rarely a best-in-slot item for each equipment slot. And it does help that rare items drop constantly. Any rare drop you see could be the rare that you need. And as opposed to Diablo 3's relatively long droughts in endgame gear drops, the time between each rare item in Path of Exile is almost negligible, meaning a much greater reward frequency over time. But getting that great rare item is still a challenge. There are so many different affixes, each with extremely large value ranges, that rolling a perfect rare item, that is, an item with the maximum possible number of affixes, each with the maximum possible stat, is basically impossible. And it's this impossibility that helps to keep us pushing the metaphorical lever, even after we've already sunk hundreds of hours into the game. So far, we've looked at two of the four schedules of reinforcement, variable ratio and fixed ratio. Next time, we'll take a look at variable interval and fixed interval scheduling. But if you think there's anything we left out from our variable ratio and fixed ratio discussion, feel free to let us know. We also want to give really special thanks to all of our patrons on Patreon. And we also want to welcome all the new patrons since the last analysis video. So, <clears throat> Alchemic, Parker Myers, John Hathaway, Julian Detris, Sam Myers, Delicious IB, Austin Yarger, C Bomber, David Lopez, Sebastian Becker, Useless Torch Studios, Moogle Girl, Cat Prog, Arno Benefice, Brian Hinson, Atlas Jackson, and Brian Feral Pony Feeney. Can we get a round of applause for these guys, please? Oh, that's just me clapping alone in an empty room. Alright then, well thank you guys. We really appreciate your support, and thank you for watching Game Soup.